Hi everyone, and welcome to the Viva Bootcamp online videos. My name is Lahir, I'm a full-time anaesthetist at Western Health in Victoria. And with these online videos, I want you to just go through them at your own pace and stop at the appropriate moment so you can practice your answers. So make sure you speak out your answers. I want you to get really used to thinking on the fly, talking out your answers as you would normally in a Viva to get the best experience out of these videos. And so now I'll transition to the actual videos from the day. So I do a lot of teaching um, in various ways, but I think what I really enjoy is trying to find a niche that isn't formally taught, that isn't formally uh, you know, dressed by ANSC or any of the colleges, and just trying to fill that gap um, of teaching and try to, try to um, I guess, deliver something that's worthwhile, worthwhile to the trainees. This Fiber Bootcamp started when I first became a consultant back in 2014. And what I noticed that a, a lot of the things that um, we came up in our study group by just watching the best people and you know, people are really amazing at talking in in tricky situations in the Viva as well as modeling ourselves off the past exam prize winners and the consultants we thought were just so good at communicating we use those techniques and I, I thought those those specific techniques and language structures were just a massive reason why I did so well in the exam um, back in 2012 so I thought you know I've been running this for quite a few years now and pretty much just giving this at the right time um, for you guys to, I guess, digest it after you've gone through a lot of your knowledge and your, and your study as it is. Um, the, the best part about this stuff, I really love teaching this, it's, it's really harnessing what you already know, but just to take that knowledge and try to make it and synthesize it to make your answers sound sharper, clearer, and with more impact. Um, and the more I've thought about this um, in, in my actual day-to-day -day practice, it really doesn't feel like it's just exam technique. It really feels like this is what it takes for me to communicate better and more efficiently with my staff as well as organize my thoughts a lot better as well. So obviously this is an online format and anyone who's done my lectures for the, you know, for the part two course or my other, other sessions, they know that I, I try to make it as interactive as possible. So I'll go through lots of different cases and I'll really try to drill those points I'm trying to get across. And what will happen, everyone's on mute right now so they can speak through the phone or in person to their partner going through these exercises, just taking in, in turn one case per person. Because again, I feel like this exam is all about trying to replicate the situation that you'll be in. You'll be in this, in this environment where you're speaking to a colleague about a complex scenario and that can be quite confronting. So if you're not speaking, if you're not in that position where you're putting your thoughts out there for judgment, that's something that you really need to get used to to get through this exam. Um, and there'll be you know, little point in your preparation as you've seen of not trying to play the game as, as it's played in, in real life. After that, I'll then just you know, request someone on the screen uh, to share their answer. Um, after I hear that answer, I'll just share my approach and make any suggestions. But the most important thing to know is that, you know, this is just your opinion and my opinion. And, you know, a lot of the time, based on what someone says, I will change my answer for the next time because they may have raised a really good point that I haven't thought about either. I want to stress you to a certain extent as well, just to, you know, enhance that learning experience. So I expect that everyone will be tired by the end of the day and that, that's exactly what we want. I make this general disclaimer, which is pretty obvious that, you know, this is not medical advice. Any specific patient you've had, you really need to uh, do, do the management based on your treating team and the consultant. Now, this is one of the biggest things that we, we do in our SIM training, which is that, you know, we come from a place that, I, you know, I believe that everyone participating in this session today is intelligent and capable and, you know, cares about doing their best and wants to improve. So, you know, you might say a really amazing answer at one time and another person might say an answer that they, you know, wish they could change. And that's completely fine. It's about just doing your best, trying to improve, getting all your mistakes out now, because trust me, you'll be making plenty of errors and mistakes over the rest of your career, um, but this is about improving and the only way you can improve is constant small failures uh, and that's completely fine as well. Now I wanted to just just make, make note of something that I think we, we all go through. Um, this exam for me was actually the hardest you know, mental strain for me in my, in my whole life really and that's, that's, I guess that's kind of a privilege that an exam is the hardest mental strain I've gone through, um, but again it's still real and I know a lot of you will be having a, having a bit of a hard time plus add on COVID-19 with that, it's, it's really, it's really a you know, tricky situation. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with seeking help. I know there's a lot of resources out there these days, but really important that, that that's, a, that's a thing, seeking help, um, just talking to someone, whether it's your GP or a friend, um, and taking time off if you need it, um, because, you know, no, nothing is gonna be as important as your health, because this career you've got is, it's, it's in the decades, not in the, you know, not, not in the weeks to months. But I also try to fall back on this, um, which didn't help me at the time, but you know, it's something I think of a lot these days. 
um, that you know, even if I fail at everything in life from here, I'm still one of the most successful people that have lived on Earth, and that's really ever in the history of time. So I, I try to think of that just philosophically because I know that this, this process, especially for you guys, is gonna be very tricky and very difficult. Just to go through, you know, why, why is this exam challenging? I've thought a lot about this over the past, um, and I think it's the fact that it's a very odd training process. We have a grueling first part exam, which isn't very clinically based, and we spend a lot of time uh, you know, spent on that, maybe up to 12 to 24 months on that. Then we relax after losing, we're losing our life to that exam. And over the next few years, we have so many different consultant supervisors, uh, and each of these supervisors will tell you that their way is the best way. And that other way that the, consultant, the other consultant did just yesterday you know, is ridiculous. Um, so with those different opinions, the different hospitals, different approaches and opinions, anything that suddenly becomes a bit more complex and conflicting uh, with multiple issues can be challenging. And I think this exam is a lot about finding what that, what that normal is. So I think this exam is necessarily difficult because of the process you've been through with, making, with the lack of decision making and the, the delay in decision time that you've had. So I think it's really interesting that now is the time you really start doing anesthesia. By the time of your exam, you'll have done maybe a hundred vivas, and each viva may have, say, one to two challenging situations or issues. But I, what I'm trying to do with this, this process here, or this session here, is to concentrate that experience. So I want to drill the hardest parts of the viva to get you to peak exam fitness. So it's really just high reps focus training. It's hit training for this exam is the way I'd like to think about it. Now, the constant theme that I think of uh, through all of, my, all of my little topics here is that there's this kind of concept called the critical issue. Um, and something you've probably heard about, you know, the critical issue or the main issue or the point of difference. And just to, just to really explain what I mean by that, um, because it is a common thread that we'll go through. Every job has many repetitive elements. And through your first few years, essentially you're learning what normality is. You're learning how to do a standard history. You're learning how to do a standard assessment, a standard machine check, standard ALS and BLS, standard airway assessment. Everything is pretty standard, standard induction, standard para progress. And that's all new, and you have to repeat that countless times to get your expertise and proficiency. But now, now you'll notice that there's some things that are above normal, they're really specific or critical for anesthesia. And this exam, I'd argue, is pointing out those things based on the patient, the operation, maybe your surgeon, the hospital, or your assistant. For example, a patient might be coming for a lap coli, but they've got a big thyroid mass, a thyroid goiter. Um, suddenly that really is the only thing that matters. Everything else will run pretty smoothly just because it's very standard. Maybe the operation is a, you know, a normal nephrectomy, but, but the tumor is invading near a vessel. So suddenly a normal nephrectomy has this added element of you know, blood loss risk. Chuck onto that a Jehovah's Witness patient or someone who might refuse blood and it adds another level of complexity. And I'd say that these are the things you need to point towards or direct your attention to in the viva first and also potentially in real life because the other stuff is normal. And maybe a surgeon is particularly uh, you know, error prone, maybe they take longer. Maybe the hospital is just a day center, it doesn't have your uh, ICU and your ECMO backup. Um, or maybe that awake fiber optic that you're doing uh, is going to be with the grad nurse and not the most senior nurse assistant um, helping you. So in real life, these critical issues are really and you know, necessarily what we devote a lot of our attention to. And I think that we'll notice a lot of these things naturally as we go into you know, experience practice. But in the Viva, this is what they're looking for. It's probably a big thing for me to say that you know, to you because you're the, you're the, you're the ones who'll be sitting through this exam. So in the, over the last couple of years, I, I've been an exam observer and I can just guarantee you that they're regularly looking to hear these critical issues. And what's interesting for me is that this is surprisingly never officially mentioned during your training. And I think that is it's unusual, but I can understand why. In my experience as an exam observer, it's also interesting because the college examiners do make expert opinion judgments and this is not necessarily the right thing to do but it's just the reality and this might be especially difficult if you're not from an Australian culture Australian training program so I know in the past over the last few decades you know Victorian anesthesia is very much about you know in epiglottitis you do an inhalational induction but there's so many cases out there case series out there in many other countries even other states where people are doing rapid sequence inductions for epiglottitis with no increased morbidity or mortality Similarly with IV induction tamponades. I remember one of my students back in the day, he was a Chinese anesthetist with so much experience with cardiac and uh, liver anesthesia. And he, it was the very last viva that he was in. There was a tamponade case and he expressed in, during the viva that he would do an IV induction for the tamponade. 
is the last viva and the examiner just happened to ask him, oh, that was interesting that you want to do an IV induction. That's, that's not traditionally what we would do in Australia. And he said, look, I've done over a hundred of these inductions intravenously and not one problem with them. That's definitely the standard that we do in his hospital in China. And so while I don't think it's particularly fair that they might have a certain Australian bias, I think part of your journey in this exam is to ask so many questions that you understand what the Australian practice is and what normal is. And if you really do believe that you need to do something outside of what, you know, I guess a normal realm is, then you can make mention of that. You can, you know, appreciate that this is a normal practice in Australia, but then go ahead with your plan. And I've, I've got to say the examiners are very reasonable in that regard. Um, but they're also just human as well. So one of the things is that examiners are human. I mean, I think we've all experienced that whether we're, when we're examining other people or when we're being examined, that sometimes they might not hear something. So in amongst everything else that you'll be doing, I make particular attention to change my, the pace of my voice, the speed, the emphasis, if I'm about to come to something very important. And imagine that the, you know, the um, examiner is trying to take something you know, written. It would be really pertinent to make sure you have eye contact with them as you're about to make that really powerful statement. They also hear the same thing over and over again, so it would be so important to uh, you know, change the way you phrase things, change your speech, to make it a bit more interesting and less full of cliches. And the fact is that we're gonna be training with each other throughout all, you know, all the next few months, so we will sound quite similar, and it's just important to try and get out of that realm of, you know, trying to, of sounding very similar. This is the marking guide. I had a look at this guide, and I definitely don't want you to look at everything, but just to, just to understand that the marking guide is, can be very subjective, like what is outstanding versus excellent. Um, the fail guides are even less rigorous. Just to, just to know that it's not like there's a table with people marking specific areas you know, in this exam. And so the, the take home point for me from this is that this exam, the interpretation of your ability can be very subjective. And a lot of that is your ability to frame things in the right way um, and, and just communicate in this way that's just so effective that people perceive your expertise. And again, it's just the game we have to play and it's not something I think is right or wrong, it's just, it's just one of those things. So the take home point from this, there's probably a lot of subjective, subjectivity to it, so it's our job to sound professional and consultant-like. The, the way I look at this Viva is that I think of the Viva as having three rough sections, anesthesia, knowledge and frameworks, then crisis management and then professional document related issues. And just to expand that, I'm going to try and go from start to finish a process of the Viva. Um, so knowledge and content, we'll try to go from the start, the, uh, a summary statement, uh, anesthetic assessment, making decisions, a priority statement, critical anesthetic inductions. They'll go through quite a bit of how I frame crisis management and some of the professional documents that are most likely to be examined. So let's begin.